So our next speaker is Michael Richardson, who I have known for, um, I think, almost 30 years or something like that. Um, um, I even bought once a bicycle for him. Um, um, and um, um, he's going to s speak to us about interesting things, I believe, because every and each time I have been working with it, it has been a very interesting time. The first time was actually when we were building S uh, the first versions of SSH together with Stato Ulanen. So it's been a while since. So Michael, please. Yeah, I haven't. Hello. Okay, does it work? Um, so yeah, last time I was in Helsinki was 22 years ago, and I lived here for about three, three months and three different occasions. So I got all the seasons in. And as Pekka said, he, he bought, uh, bought a bicycle and let me use it for the first month. So I rode through February and March, which is uh, uh, much easier here than in Canada. I'm going to tell you that. So I was quite, ex quite experienced with winter riding. So I'm here to talk to you about um, um, brewski, um, which in Canada speak and Midwestern United States speak is um, a, uh, a, uh, a, a way of talking about beer. Because you know it's a kind of a Polish thing where you you make fun of Polish people by adding ski to all sorts of words, uh, perhaps insensitive. But anyway, bootstrapping remote secure key infrastructure, and we got the R in there so we could call it Brewski specifically. So this is an ITF spec, and I'm going to talk a little bit about. Does this work? It's probably not paired right, is it? Oh, you have to push it in. Put this thing in. Clicker. There we go. Plug it in, and it works. There we go. <laughs> Yep, that's good. Okay, pardon me? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I thought it, we, we, it was already projecting. It was not projecting here. It was, but something happened. Okay, you go ahead. I will try. I know nothing about Max. Because <laughs> it went, it blinked. Oh. Oh. Aha. Aha, so we have a physical... Uh, pairing problem. <laughs> All right, so there we go. So beer. Um, there's a, a. I know Lappenkulta is not the 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 the, uh, the executive class of beer in Finland, but uh, it's not bad compared to crap I buy. Um, so this talk is going to be about uh, uh, mostly about the protocol. Um, we have a half an hour. I'm going to try to get into the problems and issues I had uh, with Riot, but my goal is really to educate you about about Brewski, and, uh, which is another system, and uh, Mohit and several others know this quite well. Um, and uh, So it is an IETF spec. So who am I? I worked for a whole bunch of different companies, a whole bunch of different times, um, SSH back in 1997, um, and essentially I'm a consultant and you, know, you pay me money and I'll do things for you. Uh, what else do I do? I've spent a lot of time the last 25, 28 years doing IETF work. Um, and specifically right now, I got sucked in about 10 years ago into doing a security review of a, of a, a, a routing protocol for low power systems called Ripple RPL. And uh, I was lured into the dark side of the IoT there. And specifically, I got sucked into this, this thing of how do we provision devices into networks and doing it without touching them, ideally. So what is the problem? All right, you get a brand new teddy bear cam for your house. How many have one of these? No one will admit to it. <laughs> um, this one apparently, which I actually own a, one of these, specifically bought on eBay, is one of the ones that has like 17 explo uh, exploits to it. Um, and it's an interesting device to, to use for, you know, does, my ex does things work? So you get one of these, you want to bring it to your home, or maybe you have something bigger, a gas turbine which you want to bring to your factory. Same problem, same issue. So generically, we've given this a duck. Um, it is, it is good, it's good biological reasons for this. Apparently ducks uh, and many other animals will imprint themselves in, at the right time on whatever looks like their mother. And so a century ago, a biologist by the name of Lorenz discovered they would imprint on his red boots and they followed him around, thinking his boots were his mother. What you hope is that, in all of our protocols, is that you get the duct imprint on, well, the guy who owns the network, not a wolf. Unless it's a wolf SSL, I guess that's a better thing <laughs> that way. So in the terminology of protocol, we call the ducts pledges. If you've ever seen a movie called Animal House 30 years ago, 
um, pledges come and they want to join the right, uh, the right fraternity or sorority and they have to do certain things, some of those things are unspeakable, perhaps, in order to be accepted. Um, and our, less, our much more boring name for the other end is the registrar, or in our documents we call it the JRC, and that's because it's the consensus term between three different working groups at the IETF. It's the Joint Registrar and Coordinator, and it does 802.15.4 coordination uh, work as well as registrar work. So the goal is to have a relationship be between these two things. That's what the previous speaker was talking about, using a temporary Wi-Fi access point, and hopefully everything is good, and at the end of the day, you're in a relationship, okay? And I saw that on Facebook last week, and I just had to put it in. There you go. So, to start again, we have the pledge, we have the registrar, uh, and I'm seeking feedback on, you know, does that really say registrar to you, that, that icon? Maybe it doesn't. Uh, I think I might change his head a little bit. We'll see. That's, uh, trying to get some good graphical view of what this is and get people to steal my, the views so that everyone is speaking about the same things. So, uh, the registrar has a manufacturer. As Mohit said recently, um, not every manufacturer wants to put unique keys or th into things. I'm going to assume that they do and are willing to do that and are willing to be convinced of that it's worthwhile. And there's a bunch of, of, of stuff in the silicon space, of the si system on chip space, that is actively trying to make this really cheap. So I'm going to assume that they win and it works out, and there's a bunch of things. So the manufacturer is going to install a certificate, a key pair, at manufacturing time. There's an IEEE spec, 802.1AR, for this, and they call it an iDev ID. So they do that. And it's signed by the manufacturer. So in the initial part, it's relatively easy. The pledge can convince the device that it is a legitimate device and not, as it turns out, some industries have massive issues with, with uh, fake devices, but it is a legitimate device to the thing. So that's pretty easy to do at one level. I'm a new device, it's good. Um, the challenge is the other direction. How does the device know it's on the right network and not the network next door, the wolf? Okay, that's what this is about. So, we assume in our protocol that there's this thing called a MASA, the Manufacturer's Authorized Signing Authority. Bit of a mouthful, but the reason why we, we, we don't just call it the manufacturer is assume that it's going to be, it may be outsourced or maybe uh, uh, have, a, have a lifetime. We hope it'll have a lifetime longer than ma the manufacturer. And we assume that the pledge gets a trust anchor to that thing. So this basically means you burn a public key into your firmware at, boot, at uh, manufacturer time. And so the process is that essentially we get the MASA to produce a voucher, beer ticket here, um, which we're going to give to the owner. And the owner is going to redeem the voucher and is going to get a relationship with the device. So that convinces the device that this is the right manufacturer. Doctor Who fans? No? Nobody's a Doctor Who fan? Really? Wow. Okay. Well, I won't tell you about the, the guy with the, the face who asks, are you my mummy? Because it won't mean anything to you. So basically, what am I doing? What I go like, in this, the spring, uh, I said, look, uh, it's, it's, my reference code has gotten far enough with a Linux-based reference client written in Ruby, which isn't very useful, doesn't going to go very in place. I want one that runs on a real embedded system and decided that Riot was the right place to go. Um, uh, partly because it has support for both Wi-Fi and 802.15.4 and the other systems I was using at the time, for instance, Kotiki on the same uh, kind of platforms, don't really support Wi-Fi that well. There aren't that many reference things and the, the, there's lots of reasons to go with Riot and you guys all know them. Um, I would like to share my code base with uh, bigger systems, um, Android, IoT, other things like this. I would like to write it in a memory safe language. I've been writing code in C since I was 14, and my ability to stay up all for the whole weekend fueled by caffeine to debug null pointer dereferences is pretty much done. I've paid for it. I've, I have the diabetes to pay for it and stuff like that, and I don't want to do that anymore. My health depends upon a memory self language. So does yours, okay? I don't want to write all the code. I want to, want to leverage as many libraries as possible. And of course, I want to do it in as few bytes as possible. In particular, one of the key things is that if you say to your product marketing people, 
I need um, an extra 12 kilobytes of ROM, which means you have to go into a bigger you know, system on chip size, for my enrollment protocol, they're like, I don't care about that, <laughs> right? That's always been the story for security. So part of the goal is to do the security only with the tools that you know are already going to be in the device. So that may be a challenge, but that's the goal here. So what is the work plan? Build a client run in Rust, run it on, on uh, client library in Rust, run it, test it on Linux, compile it to RioOS natively, and then, uh, excuse me, did I write native? I write native, not na naive. I think I, I was thought for a moment I mistyped that. Um, and uh, uh, target, I'm going to target the ESP32 device specifically. Um, I was at a, another conference about a year ago uh, dealing in air quality, actually, in Belgrade, and we wound up with an ESP32 running. Well, I never really figured out what it ran because the guys really weren't sure what they were running on it. They used some integrated development environment to do it all. And, and I was like, you don't know what OS you're running? I don't know. I don't think we're running an OS. And I realized that I wanted my code in that OS that they weren't running, okay, there. So I wanted in every reference implementation so that it's just trivial for anyone to do it. They don't even know that they're doing it. That device actually had the mechanism of the previous speaker of control things, which put up a temporary little access point that lets you configure it and this kind of stuff. So that's all been done, and, and my washing machine does that. And every single one of those devices, nice, but they all need their own app. And I've noticed that the apps go stale. They don't get updated year to year to year. And in 20 years, I don't even know if apps are, are going to be written in Java for Android or iOS in the same languages. So what are you going to do when you need to reboot your washing machine in 10 years? I hope my, washing, my new washing machine lasts 10 years. My old one didn't. Um, but I hope that it will. What are you going to do? So we need a standardized protocol. That's part of what it has to have. It has to be app independent. Any generic app will bootstrap any device. So that was the goal. Reality, still very much early work in progress. Almost embarrassing, though, like I have 1,000, maybe 700 lines of code or something like this. Not the walk in the park I'd hoped for, but very little had this had anything to do with Riot. So that's the good news. Riot was really just really a pleasure to work with, and I was very happy. Most of it, the fact that I also decided to do it in a new language that I hardly knew, which was Rust. And uh, that's where some of the difficulties were. So what does it look like? Um, you find the proxy. Why do you need a proxy? Well, you're not really on the internet yet, so you need to find how to get something to help you on it. In the Wi-Fi space, that might be a 1x uh, uh, interface, um, WPA kind of thing. In the 15.4, um, the ITF's in the process of designing specs for doing this for, for things. Um, then you create a connection. You might use ad hoc, which is a, a, a new protocol that's not yet standardized. Um, Ericsson is very much involved in this. Um, or you might use DTLS. Um, then you encode some stuff. A voucher request is what we call it. You sign it. You send it to the to the. You send it through the registrar, and it gets sent to the manufacturer, uh, the NASA specifically. And then you get back a voucher, which you need to verify. And everything's good. Then you're connected. So what do I need? I need to have a security layer. I need to have some object signing uh, uh, things. I need to have some CBORs and coders and decoders, um, and um, that's it. In this list, I hope you noticed that it, I did not say I needed to have a X509 PKI system because it's specifically designed to not want one of those. Despite the fact that the identity of the pledge is an X509 certificate, the pledge itself never actually has to treat it as other than a blob of bytes that you send to the internet. Um, the internet, of course, has to decode it and figure itself up with it, but on the, on the new device, that's not necessary. And I hope that's a feature uh, that, that matters, that will reduce the code space significantly. And if it doesn't reduce the code space, at least it reduces the number of things that you have to test, because there's a lot of branch points in that space that I want to do. How much time do I have? Okay, so we're good. So what are the differences between DTLS and ad hoc? Um, so this is an important thing. Um, if you're running co-app over DTLS, which is co-app-s, then you're essentially running co-app inside DTLS, and you really have, for the co-op parts of there, and this, the, then there's not really any extra security. So we put our voucher in there, and we're pretty much done. It looks exactly like HTTP and HTTPS that way. If, however, you're running OS Core and ad hoc, 
and you can see that there's some layers that are reversed. The security is inside a co-op rather than outside a co-op, but in fact, it secures part of the co-op headers. So that's interesting. Quick is very similar that way, by the way, um, but they've co-evolved. Um, so those are the two things I would like to support, and in particular because that lets us potentially get away without an SSL library if it turns out your device doesn't need one. If you've already got an SSL library because you have to do a bunch of other stuff, well, okay, go ahead, that's great. But the goal is to do it for, for something that's too small or uh, would like to use its generous code space for making money rather than doing security. So what did I look through? So I went through a bunch of, of, of options and, and I discovered just going through the Riot OS, and the first time I used Riot OS was about a, two years ago or something like this, and I think it predates the, a lot of the packaging that happened. So now I was like, oh, wow, I have all these different choices. Wow, now I have to make decisions. So that turned out to be actually a bit of a challenge. Which ones do I knew? I actually had to do some research into a bunch of them. Um, and the other side of this, as I said, I would like my code, the client, to run on many things other than Riot OS. So I would prefer to write everything in Rust. On the other hand, I would like to not duplicate as much code as any code as possible. So I would prefer to do everything in Riot OS. So those are my, my, my tussle between the two. Um, Rust has a bunch of things, and one of, the, one of the interesting things is it has this mechanism called no STD, um, and I get, guess Christian is probably going to talk about a bunch about that later. Um, but specifically, that means you can profile it such that all the libraries, if they support this, means they support running in an embedded system. So they don't assume a file system or processes or a bunch of other stuff, or even memory allocation. Memory allocation is not needed for that. So that puts some constraints on what you're doing. So I went through about four different uh, versions and uh, Rust has this uh, serialization and deserialization process and, and I think I have concluded that I don't want to use it. That it's really beautiful but actually I think it actually makes it very very difficult to potentially deal with hostile objects that come from the remotely because they cause Rust exceptions rather than me going, huh, there's a bunch of stuff I don't know about, ignore them. Christian is not is is shaking his head, so you know I'm still I'm still trying to figure that out. I think I want to use Cbor Event, which is basically just going to decode them and give me some stuff, and then I'll put it together myself. But I don't know for sure that way. On the other hand, I could go to with one of the Cbor libraries from the Riot OS and wrap them. That's another option, and I don't know enough about them at this point to say which one I want to do. But I put the star next to Nano Cbor because. I want COSI signatures. And libcosi says it requires nano CBOR. Aha! So, or I can use the Rust version. So I've been go going through which one do I want, okay? And so and you can see at this point, I'm like, well, I'm going to have more Riot OS code. And libcbor, libcos will run on a lot of different places, but isn't memory safe? I don't, haven't figured that out. I need a DTLS library if I'm going the DTLS way. To this list, I should clearly add Wolf's SSL because I didn't know it ran that way, um, and I will do that. Um, one of the options is I, there's a very nice wrapping of embed TLS in Rust, and so if someone wanted to do embed TLS, that would really, really work for me. Um, uh, but as far as I understand, it's not really well ported to Riot OS. Could be wrong, but as far as I can see, that's the case. Um, I need an ad hoc library if I'm going to do ad hoc. Well, that's pretty new. There isn't one. I'd really prefer to write it in Rust, um, but I can get convinced otherwise. OS core library, I don't even know where I, I, I it's no idea yet. <laughs> um, so uh, this is where I come to. I'd really like to, to I'm, I'm basically trying to make a decision at this point. If I do it entirely in Rust, then I'm gonna have Cbor event, create coast, and tweet NAC, uh, sodium chloride. Um, NACL. It took me a while in reading to realize that was a chemical formula, not a, and why it's called libsodium. It's also kind of, took me a while to figure that I went, oh, duh, grade 11 chemistry. Um, and that's it. So I'm, I'm looking at which to do here that way. And there's a similar, a similar kind of op discussion for DTLS. So the conclusions. I really like the Riot OS package system. It's really, really nice. Um, but it makes it real hard for me to grep for things. So I'm like, oh, this, this code does this. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, go to GitHub, check it out. 
Okay, wander through the code base. Okay, what does it require? What does it depend upon? Okay, so, and then I'm looking for commonalities, and so I'm basically wandering through the dependency tree. And so while I would have preferred to have been coding to one of these things, I actually spent my time basically reading different module source codes, trying to figure out, is this going to work with this? How big is it? How am I going to turn it, do, how am I going to know whether or not the, the guy that I'm giving my library to is going to want to work with what I'm doing? So that's a real question. I don't want to write my code for six different libraries, but I want to use whatever it is someone else is doing. So life was actually a bit simpler before the packaging uh, because less flexibility forced my hand. So I will be focusing on the Rust parts of my library because they're not working yet. Until they work, I don't care about the Riot OS. But I want to make sure that I am going to be making sure that I'm building it for Riot OS regularly because I don't want to be surprised at the end of the day that I've just produced a six megabyte executable and I have 64K to go in it, right? Um, and that's the real thing. So questions? Hi, Mohit again. Um, so at the very early on in the presentation, you give the example of this teddy bear which had 17 exploits. And you expect the same manufacturer to also issue you certificates, put keys, and run, run servers. I'm, no, not saying, I'm not saying it will not happen. I'm saying it will happen, but only few manufacturers will do that. And I will predict five years later, Yari will come and give a speech of how we have centralized to only a couple of manufacturers who do brewski, but not others. That's an interesting observation. I don't expect the teddy bear, teddy bear manufacturer to do something. I actually expect them to go to business. Um, and I, I, believe, and I have, a, have a lot of feeling that this is going to happen. So there is a, um, there, ISOC has been running an IoT security um, multi-stakeholder process. And I believe that with, by the end of 2020, we will have voluntary uh, labeling of many, many, many countries that is essentially going to push that teddy bear manufacturer out of business. Because essentially they haven't provided any firmware updates, they haven't done anything and it's going to be clearly labeled to consumers who are going to be, at this point, a little bit wiser. However, to, to your point about five manufacturers, um, it looks like this problem is a serious, serious problem within the industrial IoT space, and price is an issue for them, but long-term uh, support and maintenance is a bigger issue for them. So, I believe they will come with a 75 pound mallet and they will beat, the, the owners uh, are going to beat the manufacturers into submission for this. So whether or not they already have IDEV ID certificates in quite a number of their devices, they just don't use them very well. Um, so I think that is really what, where it's gonna go. Is that going to get teddy bears upgraded? I don't know, probably not, okay, um, but I also believe there's space for five or six different systems and different mechanisms, and um, I think that's going to happen, and that's okay. I don't mind having five apps on my phone. 75 apps, one for every appliance, isn't going to work, right? And by the way, I got a message this morning that says my laundry was done, and clearly that was my wife. <laughs> Anyone else? So there's reference code. Um, it is uh, going to be MI. It is all MIT licensed um, at this point. Um, so the other components that I show, you can download in Docker containers and run and things like that. Michael, yeah, thanks for this uh, talk. Um, you, you talked about like s some forces that might, um, you know, push some companies out of business and maybe keep some others in. Um, but you didn't mention, like, what, do you think uh, uh, regulation is needed to help uh, shape the, these types of um, uh, things, or is it, can we be all market regulated? Um, I'm gonna answer the question with yes. Inclusive <laughs> <laughs> or. Okay, um, I believe that we will have uh, voluntarily labeling with a number of governments uh, agreeing on the shape and form and some iconography of the labels 
of what they do. For instance, one of the examples of the label is, this device contains an active microphone. You probably should know this, okay, um, to what's going on. That's an example of something that will happen. And I believe that that will probably be, uh, let's say, uh, five of the G7 uh, plus maybe China internally, because they're shipping to us, within two or three years. Of those, my bet, one of those countries will put mandatory regulation on it. Whether that's California or Germany or Australia, I don't know. One of them will do that. It'll be a terrible disaster, okay? But the push up to that is going to force basically the voluntary stuff on, uh, to really, oh, we'd much rather voluntarily do this than submit to this arbitrary uh, panel. So that's what I think will happen. Um, I also believe that if you buy any, I call them web-connected devices, the things that call back to the, the cloud, if you buy any of those things this year or next year, you'll be throwing them out in 2021 because they won't have be upgradable and all that stuff. So at this point, I, unfortunately, I think we have a, a future of, of increased landfill for a couple of years before we get to devices that truly can sustain for 20 years. And I really didn't want to buy a new washing machine. My old one died. And my new one came with Wi-Fi, and I actually ordered the one without Wi-Fi. <laughs> but apparently that model just, just doesn't really exist. So that's sad. Okay, thank you.